Unsurprisingly, the opening of the creed deals with what Christians believe about God the Father. We use images like Father or, or what have you um, as a means to try to get a handle on the reality of God. Of course, we can't do that. We cannot encompass God within any human frame of reference or any system of, uh, of symbols. And so we begin with, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And this word Father, I think, is very important. To say that God is Father is uh, 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 an amazing claim, uh, which has all sorts of practical implications in our lives. We don't believe that the world is run by an impersonal force. We don't believe that it's the outworking of just uh, physics or astrophysics. Uh, we don't believe that fate rules our lives. We don't believe that the stars govern our lives. We believe that there is a personal God who made us and who loves us, who is in charge of our lives. It's reminding us that God is the one who brings us into being. And more than that, that God as Father is one who cares for us, as, for example, an earthly father would care about his children. So the idea of God as Father is immediately setting up this idea of a God who can not simply be trusted, but a God who can be known in a personal way. The first time in the Old Testament that we discover God being called Father, it's actually said the other way around. God says to Pharaoh in Egypt, Israel is my son, my firstborn, therefore let my people go that they may serve me. And then often looking back, from uh, later perspectives, the Jews look back at that time and say, surely you are our father. So the idea of God's fatherhood in the book of Exodus is very closely bound up with the fact that God has been secretly nurturing this family all along, and now it's time to act. They believed, because Moses came back from the desert with this message, that God was their father in this sense, that the one who'd made the world and was in covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their ancestors, had now heard them in distress, crying for help, and was coming to rescue them. Then again, developing out of various Old Testament passages, we see the idea of Father both as creator and as nurturer, as the one who brings his people up. Um, some lovely passages um, in the Old Testament which speak of, yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. This picture of the father teaching the little boy to walk and then grieving that the boy then rebels against him when he grows up. And so it's deep rooted in the Old Testament. And though our human experience of fathers may be tainted, uh, may be disappointing, as many of us had great fathers, uh, but not all have experienced good fatherhood humanly. We shouldn't project our human experience of fatherhood onto God, but rather understand God is the unique, brilliant, ultimate, excellent model of fatherhood. It's not as though we've created God in the image of our fathers. On the contrary, the idea is that true fatherhood is a reflection of the fatherhood of God. God who is loving, caring, compassionate, all those things that we would want our fathers to be, and yet many people would have to say, my father wasn't like that. But when I look to God, I come to God the Father, and I find there somebody who does understand me because he made me. He understands me because he even knows my thoughts. He knows my thoughts from afar off, as the Old Testament scripture says. That's a wonderful thought, that he actually knows not merely what I look like, not merely how I feel, but he knows my very thoughts. And that means he instructs, he guides, he provides, he cares, he corrects, he disciplines, and ultimately he has authority over us, all within a very personal, intimate relationship.